on a number of occasions when I'm asked to introduce someone, uh, sometimes I can say I've known the speaker since he was a little boy. I can't say that. Or I might say uh, I know him since he graduated from school, but I can't say that either. Or I might say I knew him when he worked at such and such a congregation, but I can't say that. In fact, I just met Brother Byron Hatcher a few minutes ago, and uh, I was filled in on some information with regard to his background. I'll not share that with you. I'll let him share that with you if he so desires. But Byron Hatcher is the preacher for the Cape Fear Church of Christ in Fayetteville, North Carolina. He and his family are in their sixth year of this work. Brother Hatcher has been preaching for almost 20 years, and he has preached for congregations in North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Tennessee, and Mississippi. His foreign mission work includes work in Canada, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. He earned his bachelor's degree in music education from the University of Montevallo and is a 2012 graduate of the Memphis School of Preaching. He is currently an instructor at Central Carolina School of Preaching, and he teaches classes via the Skype to Four Seas School of Bible and Missions in Singapore. He's married to Jennifer. They have two children, Kelly and Bryn. Am I pronouncing that correct? And Bryn. And he's going to be speaking to us this afternoon Humility under fire. Come speak to us, brother. Thank you, Brother Ray Castor. It is such a great honor, privilege to be here to speak on this wonderful program here at the Memphis School of Preaching Lectureship. And I count it all joy and have been looking forward since the invitation uh, to being here with you and so grateful that you are here. Uh, this congregation, as well as the school, means so much to me, and I would be remiss if I did not express my appreciation to Sister Sherry Brown and what she means to uh, my family and to me. Uh, it is really because of her, apparently, my application for the school back in uh, 2010. I uh, came across her desk at one point in time. And she saw that I had a degree in music education from Montevallo. And uh, she took that uh, application to the elders here. And I got a call from one of the elders. And so uh, I've never tried out before as a song leader. But apparently they wanted me to try out. And so, <laughs> and so I did. <laughs> and uh, for, for two, almost two wonderful years while I was a student, while all of my uh, preaching uh, classmates were off preaching the word somewhere else. I was here leading the, the congregation here at Forest Hill in its singing. And uh, I, I appreciate that so much and uh, enjoyed my time here. And I always began, uh, since all my, my classmates were out preaching the word, uh, you might recall that as I got up to lead that morning, Sunday morning, uh, song service, I would quote a verse of scripture and then begin to lead singing. And what a great and wonderful time that was. And that was because of Sister Sherry Brown. We certainly uh, congratulate her and I know the school is going to miss her quite a bit. We have a number, of course, here, but also, you know, while we are here in this particular place, there are also individuals that are streaming uh, these services online and so we have a number who are streaming the services and no doubt I uh, haven't seen of course but uh, no doubt mom and dad who are always somewhere else uh, they, they, that's what they do and so no doubt they are streaming the services and I appreciate them so much I am a Memphis School of Preaching baby and uh, I was born in Memphis and my very first time to go to uh, services was at Coleman Avenue. And uh, that's where then I first uh, entered into a church building. And I still have the little New Testament that Coleman Avenue gave uh, mom uh, and has my name on it. And so that's a very special thing then to me. Well, on Friday then, as Jennifer and I were coming 
to the school for the lectureship. We had to deliver uh, a bed to my daughter. She's moving out of my parents' house, getting her own apartment. And so they grow up too fast, do they not? Um, I do have a 23, almost 24-year-old. I started when I was three. <laughs> and at supper, uh, Granddad and Nana, that's Sam and Margaret Eads, by the way, to those of you who might know them. Uh, and so Granddad's, uh, I was telling him, oh, I'm speaking on the Memphis School of Preaching Lectures. You know why I am speaking on that program, don't you, Granddad? He said, why, Byron? I said, Brother Mosier thought I was the best man for the job. Uh, what, what you're speaking on, Byron? Humility. <laughs> he said, Byron, they choose the speaker based on who needs it the most. He's not wrong. <laughs> Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. In verse 5, we have, as our introduction, we have submission to others. The younger are to submit to the elder. And then in the very next phrase, he says, oh, but you submit one to another. Be clothed with Humility. So there is submission that is reciprocal in nature. Verse 6. We understand that we must submit to God. It's not enough that we just submit to one another, but we must submit to the Almighty One, to God. And we need to allow Him then to work in our lives so that He may exalt us. Not when we want exaltation, but when he decides we need that. And then in verse 7, a demonstration of submissive faith. We need to cast all of our care upon him. Why? Because he's going to leave us stranded. Because when we put all of our faith into him, he is going to yank the carpet out from under us. Oh, no, I didn't mean to say all those things and give you all those promises. No, because he cares for us. And when he makes a promise, he will keep it. We can cast all of our cares on him. Because he always makes good on his promises. Humility is what we need to be even when we are under the greatest of pressures from the world. We must submit to others. We must submit to God. And we must cast our cares upon him. And it is for our good. Humility then comes from the Greek word Tapanao. And this word then is a deep sense of one's smallness. Humility, the English word then, you look that up in uh, your funk and wagnalls, as Brother Cates then would say. A modest or low view of one's own importance. Do we have a humility problem in the Lord's church today? Do we have a humility problem in the world? Certainly we do. But God's children, as the Bible then defines humility, Philippians 2 and verse 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. What a great picture of humility. 
of humility, being of low mind. As we walk around meeting brethren from time to time, we might even see or recognize that someone is going through some difficulty. I'm glad I'm not that person. I'm better than they are. We're comparing ourselves with them. That's the wrong comparison. We ought to compare ourselves with the standard, not with someone else. And by the way, I have some problems that they don't have. They might actually be stronger than me. If I would just take the time to get to know them and understand them even better, God's children then should always be clothed with humility, with that lowliness of mind, never to have that I am better than you attitude. And when I have this then, this is the beginning of loving one another. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. We need to love one another. Go down to uh, chapter 3, there verse 8. Finally, be all of one mind. Unity, how do I accomplish that? I have compassion one for another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Let's see one another as God sees us. I need to then be humble in my own mind. I am not greater than you. As a matter of fact, I'm going to esteem that you are greater than me. That helps me. That helps me a lot. But humility is under fire. Humility is under fire from the world. Humility is under fire even in the Lord's body. But we can overcome those things and do as God would have us to do, to have a mindset of lowliness, of meekness. We can accomplish those things. There are three different ways. This siege, you know, I think of, of humility under fire. I think of these, uh, these great siege, wooden siege towers. And, you know, in the medieval times, you would have the, the castle and all the, the walled cities and how they would storm those castles and walled cities. They would, they would erect these wooden towers with wheels on the bottom and and roll them up to the, to the walls. And then the little drawbridge type thing would come down. And the, those who were inside the towers would pour over into the walls of the castle. And storm the castle that way. That's kind of what I, what I envisioned then as, as humility under fire here. But then a story comes to mind. I was about four years old. We had just moved to... We had just moved from Sylvania, Georgia, to Sylvester, Georgia. And we had not been in the house there in Sylvester, I don't know, maybe a week or so, maybe not even that long. And so I, you know, I wanted to help and be helpful around the house. And the mailbox there on the, by the street was uh, detached from the post. And it was only held together by this little wire. But it had, because of the wind, the mailbox had fallen a little bit. So I thought, you know, I'm going to help mom and dad. I'm going to go and push that mailbox up on the post again so we'll start getting our mail. So I run out there all enthusiastically. I have my T-shirt, my jeans on. I had corduroy pants, actually wouldn't take them off. And I was just a little too short to reach that mailbox. I thought, oh, here's a nice mound that I can step onto 
to help me reach the mailbox. Did I mention I was barefoot? Okay. So I stepped onto that little mound. And right as I got that mailbox positioned just right, helping mom and dad, that's when it started to feel a little tingly. And of course, I had stepped right onto a fire ant bed. And so to complete the story, I ran to the front door and I knocked and knocked as hard as my, those little fists could knock. And mama didn't come to the front door. So I had to run around the house to the back door. Well, of course, when I did that, mom came to the front door. <laughs> knocked and knocked on the back door. No, mom, so I better go back to the front door. And she waited at the front door, thankfully. And uh, many ants died on that occasion in a great bath filled with Clorox. But the siege against our faith and our assignment this afternoon against humility is just like that ant bed. It really is insignificant and in the end it will only hurt and not help. Don't lay siege to humility. Three areas then for our consideration this afternoon that lay siege to humility. The very first area is that of muscle. The world that in which we live is a sports crazed, beauty pageant, look at me society. From time to time I'll be watching sports, and it's okay to watch sports, be involved in sports, don't have anything wrong with that. Be watching that and the sportcasters will be talking about this Great athlete. I'll say he hit this home run, this ball so far. Oh, what a great person that is. And this quarterback over here, he, he can throw the ball so accurately. What a great captain and person he is. And we have people over here that are magnified for their physical attributes. People want to be on YouTube and Facebook and all kind of other kind of digital books looking at me. And they'll be highlighted in commercials and all kind of other areas. And we'll say, oh, what a good person that is. There is no physical attribute that makes anyone good. Mama said, beauty skin deep, but ugly goes all the way to the bone. <laughs> this life is temporary. I used to could run real fast. I can't run fast anymore. I used to be very physically fit and strong. not physically fit and strong anymore. When the wicked spring as the grass and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. For all flesh is as grass and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. This life is temporary. All popularity is fleeting. Society is on one individual or, or one type of thing and gone to something else in the very next moment. People want their 15 minutes of fame. You don't get 15 minutes. People do not even remember you. But that's what people desire. The Lord's church, unfortunately, is no different. How many are filling our pews every Lord's Day that when everything is going right, they're there. Oh, I'm healthy, I'm happy, but when something goes wrong, you can't find them anywhere. 
Why don't we talk to Paul about that? Second Corinthians chapter 11. What would he have to say about that kind of attitude? I'm only with God when God, it seems, is with me and doing as I want him to do. The Apostle Paul would laugh them to in their face. Where's the commitment? Where's the commitment to our Lord? Revelation 2.10. Is that not what Peter is imploring these individuals to give to God? Is their commitment? That no matter what happens, you stay with the one who is going to win. Where's our commitment to God? Why are those brethren not back on Sunday night? Why are they not back on Wednesday night? Why are they not there in gospel meetings and door knockings? And we when we try to evangelize the community, when we try to help others. Where are they? And then they knock on your door at 2 a.m. wanting you to fix everything. There's not a red phone to God. He doesn't work that way. You need to be committed to him because he is God. How then do I combat the siege against muscle. I have to make sure that my life is Christ-centered. Let's go to John chapter 6, 53 through 58. We do not, unfortunately, study this particular and read this particular passage. Oh, we know when not to read it. We don't read it on the Lord's Supper table. But then we fail to go back and read it. And apply what it means. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Lord, what are you telling us? Be committed to me. We understand this. You know, when, when I was coming up in Montgomery, Alabama, Dad preached for the, Highland, the old Highland Gardens congregation. We lived right across the street from Highland Gardens Elementary School. Right behind Highland Gardens Elementary School there was the ball fields. And when I was in the third grade, I started my baseball career on Dairy Queen team. And when we won, we got to go to Dairy Queen and get an ice cream cone. And then we moved from Montgomery, Alabama to Redwater, Texas. That's just on the west side of Texarkana, Texas, just south of I-30 there. And uh, again, more baseball. Went to Indonesia. And I lived in Jakarta, Indonesia from 13 to 17 years old. Had a great time there. Played baseball. We ate, slept drank woke baseball see we understand what that means don't we what does it mean just what the lord means here we were dedicated to baseball you see the lord says i want you to eat me i want you to drink me i want you to sleep me i want you to wake me be committed to me that's what he said my life must be Christ centered. Therefore, I can live forever. Does he not say you can live forever? For bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness is profitable to all things and has the promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. Point number two. 
There is a great siege against humility when it comes to money. You know, our society is anti-God. Okay, let me say it again. Our society is anti-God. Because we have been fed this idea of the American dream. Oh, I want a house and a picket fence and I want this and that and the other. And many in our society buy into that. As long as I have stuff, then I'm happy. Jennifer came home the other day and says, oh, by the way, um, I saw on the news that uh, we make enough money to be happy now. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> I'm finally happy. <laughs> she isn't, but I am. <laughs> The Lord didn't have that view, did he? What about that wealthy man that said, I'm going to tear my, down my barns and build bigger barns, Luke 12, 13 through 21. You know, Americans have barns. They're called storage units. And that is, if it is not now, I haven't looked at the research. If it's not now, it was the, the fastest growing business in the United States of America. Why? Because we have so much stuff that we need more storage for our stuff. It's a lie of the devil. Unfortunately, those that are in the Lord's church, too, are concerned with numbers, numbers, numbers. Elderships want to see more money coming in so that they can do more good. In Judges chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, Gideon, Jeroboam, he and God had a conversation there. Gideon, you're going to take my forces and, and go against the Midianites. Oh, there's 125,000 of them. I'm going to start off with uh, 32,000. That's not good odds, but we'll, we'll go with it. Then Jeroboam, who was Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh on, in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, mine own hand hath saved me. Uh, excuse me, Lord? 32,000 against over 125,000, that's too many? Yes, that's too many. So, 22 left because they were afraid. 10,000 left. No, get in, too many. Go down to the river. Went down to the river. And there were only 300 left. Now the numbers are right. Why? Because Israel did not need to say, look what we did. It doesn't matter if you have a congregation of 30 or 3,000. God can still do a great work. Let's not be so numbers conscious Let's not do it. When money becomes more important than souls and, and elderships see that as people in the pews as dollar bills instead of souls. 
And when that is the case, then the church is not bearing fruit. Just like Mark 4, 7, the Lord there, uh, talking about the sower and the seed. Some fell among thorny ground. And it grew up and it choked and it yielded no fruit. You see, when a person in the pew is a dollar bill, that congregation is dead. It's not bearing any fruit. Some kind of social club or something. I don't know what it is. In verse 19, the Lord then, he explains the cares of the world. The thorns are the cares of this world. The deceitfulness of riches. If we only had this much money in the bank, then we could do all kind of things for the Lord. The Lord doesn't need money. He needs you. Let's give him of ourselves. The Apostle Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, and we know this very well. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Now, verse 7 is key. He that planteth is nothing, and he that watereth is nothing. It is God that gives the increase. As long as we go and do the work, then God is going to be praised. God is going to receive the glory. You know, we have these young people sometimes or, or uh, mission groups that go out and they boast of all these great numbers, baptisms. You know, the Apostle Paul, when he went to Corinth, he said, I didn't even come to baptize. I came to preach Christ and him crucified. We need to go about doing the work. Our money is well spent when we send someone to work, regardless of how many baptisms there were. Because the importance is sowing the seed that's the number I'm concerned about. How many workers do we have? And I'm talking about real workers. People want to sit in the pews. People want to give their dimes. But they do not want to get to work. I don't think they would appreciate a conversation with the Apostle Paul, do you? Not at all. Where are we? Oh, there we are. How do we overcome this? By being content. You know, we are still successful even if we have not achieved the American dream. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Let your conversation be without covetousness, Hebrews 13, 5. And be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Is our faith in God or is it in stuff? The third and final area that humility is under fire is in the mind. You know, atheism and the promotion of evolution in our uh, world today is really the world saying, I, I, I don't want anything to do with God. Uh, he doesn't exist. And because I think that he doesn't exist, that means he doesn't. Well, that's kind of like the two-year-old or one-year-old even, you know, that uh, when you cover his eyes, that you're not there anymore. Well, just because you cover your eyes doesn't mean that the world doesn't exist now, does it? But that's what these so-called scientists believe. If I just say he doesn't exist, then he doesn't. That makes no sense at all, does it? And we try to, from time to time, reason with scientists, believing that that's what they desire. They desire proof. They desire logic and evidence. Listen, these so-called scientists do not desire facts. They are emotional because they approach their facts 
from one point of view, and that is God does not exist. And when you approach it that way, then you're going to see what you want to see. Well, that's emotional. That's not being reasonable at all. And so they cling to a false document delivered by a false prophet, Charles Darwin's Origin of the Species. No logic at all. You bring up the teleological, the ontological, the cosmological. You bring up the argument of morality. Uh, Brother Dave Miller in one of his new books even has the argument of beauty as an argument for the existence of God. Why? Because they do not want to believe in God. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. We know this passage very well. For the invisible things, verse 20, of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and foolish, their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They are foolish because they believe that there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 14, 1. They do not fear God, Romans 3 and verse 18. And when you have no fear of God, then you, you're just able to do anything. Unfortunately, many elderships have left the authority of the scriptures. Paul knew this would happen, Acts 20 and verse 30. Uh, congregations do not desire to hear the pure gospel of Jesus Christ being preached, 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. And from time to time, then, there might even be a power struggle, as we read in 3 John, verse 9 and 10. And so the mind has a, a great effect against humility. But humility then is demonstrated and wisdom by how one lives James 3 and verse 13 how one sh uh, shares the gospel with others you don't take this book and beat someone over the head with it this book is not a sledgehammer it's a sword it's a scalpel when we get into arguments on Facebook, who wins? Not God. We need to be very careful about how we address others, especially in social media. A man came to God and said, God, I want to do your will. God said, I want you to push a rock. And so this young man went outside and he pushed a rock. He pushed a rock all of his life. And then he died. And he approached the heavenly father. He said, I'm a failure. And God said, no, you're, you're successful. He said, all I did was push a rock. He said, yes, but what kind of shape were you in? Were you, weren't you strong as you pushed that rock day in and day out? Yeah, I guess I was. But I didn't influence anyone. He said, what you don't realize is that people were walking by you pushing that rock and you inspired them. And they asked me the same thing that you asked me. And I gave them their own rocks to push. He said, but God, I never moved the rock. He said, you weren't meant to. If that rock had moved, it would have crushed you. Brethren and friends, we need to push our rock. Sometimes we are tempted to say, God, your way doesn't work. But you know, 1 John 2, 16, the things that are of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, they are not of the Father, they are of the world. His way does work. Self then gets in the way 
But true humility allows God to be in control of every aspect of our lives. What happens when we fail to push the rock? The rock pushes us. But what happens when I am I come to God in, in great humility and I am crushed because of my own sin? I close with this poem. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Then the king, so bright and fair, patched Humpty up with love and care. He placed Humpty Dumpty back on the wall, just as if Humpty hadn't fallen at all.